everybody, so we're continuing on our respiratory system lecture with respiratory physiology. And I just wanted to, first of all, revisit the four different processes of respiration. So remember, respiration in a nutshell is basically getting oxygen into the body and removing CO2 from the body. Oxygen is uh, the diatomic molecule that our trillions of cells of our body need for cellular respiration, and then CO2 is a waste product of that cellular respiration. So within the context of getting oxygen into our body and then removing CO2 from our body, there's multiple sub-processes involved to bring that about in an orderly fashion to be able to shuttle these gases right between the different places in the body that they need to go to be able to, uh, to reach the cells and um, egress from the body in an orderly fashion. So those four different processes of respiration are ventilation, external respiration, transportation of the gases in our cardiovascular system, and then internal respiration. So we're going to revisit, first of all, ventilation or breathing. All right, This is just the movement of air between the atmosphere and the lungs. So inspiration is taking air into the lungs, and expiration is expelling air from the lungs, as these two little cartoons show here. And we're going to get more into the actual mechanics of ventilation coming up uh, relatively soon from now. External respiration is the exchange of gases between the lungs and the blood. Specifically, and let me bring down my little... Oh, not that. Oh, shoot. This thing is so ridiculous. So, no, I don't want that. I want... There it is. Okay, so... Specifically, we are removing CO2 from the blood and delivering it to the lungs, specifically the air sacs of the lungs, the alveoli, which we talked about in the last lecture, so that once the CO2 diffuses into the alveoli, um, it can then be exhaled from the lungs. At the same time, let me change the color here. We are taking in O2 from the alveoli and putting it into the blood. And so the context here, the stage here, is the alveoli, obviously, but also that cage of capillaries that surround the alveoli. So just as a review from last time, blood comes into the lungs through our pulmonary trunk, splitting into the right and left pulmonary arteries, and then those arteries split and 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 split until they finally get down to the level of arterioles, and the arterioles split and split and split and split and split and split and split until finally the arterioles give way to these microscopic capillary beds surrounding the 3 million or so, or I should say, no, 30 million or so alveoli of our lungs. And so then the blood percolates through these capillaries, one of which is shown right in front of you here. Um, if there's 30 million alveoli in the lungs, then there's 30 million uh, capillaries such as this in the lungs as well. And so that CO2 that's in this deoxygenated blood leaves the capillaries and goes into the alveoli. At the same time, the blood becomes oxygenated as the O2 in the alveoli comes into the capillaries. And that's why we see this color change from blue to purple to red. The blood that comes into these capillaries is deoxygenated, as is symbolized by the color blue. And then as it starts to upload the oxygen, it progresses towards red. So it, it uh, gradually transfers from purple and then to red. Then we have uh, venules draining these 30 million capillaries, and the venules converge and converge and converge and converge, as good venules do, right? And then at a certain point in time, we draw a line in the sand. We say those venules are wide enough to be considered veins, and those veins converge and converge and converge and converge and converge and converge, and converge until they finally converge into your two pulmonary veins um, emanating from your right and left lungs, and those pulmonary veins are going to be delivering that oxygenated blood back to the left side of the heart. All right, so that's the big picture. That's the big context here, but the external respiration part is just what's going on right here uh, at the level of these capillaries surrounding the alveoli. CO2 is leaving the blood and going into the alveoli, and then O2 uh, is coming in from the gas in the alveoli and entering the blood. So we just talked about how these pulmonary veins coming from the lungs are going to converge and converge and converge and converge and converge and converge, and converge until finally they, they um, converge into the two pulmonary veins from both the right and left lungs. And then that's going to take the oxygenated blood back to the left side of the heart. The left side of the heart is going to pump that oxygenated blood out through our systemic circuit. So here we have that oxygenated blood 
coming from our systemic circuit. So this is all of the arteries that are derived from our aorta, ultimately spraying off from our, from our aorta, delivering that oxygenated blood to all the different organs of the body. And those arteries are going to continue to split and split and split and split and split and split and split. At a certain point, uh, they're going to have a narrow enough diameter that we're going to call them arterioles. And then they're going to split and split and split and split and split and split and split. And then eventually they're going to split down to individual capillary beds. And that's exactly what you're seeing right here is uh, an arterial giving way to a small capillary bed. Now, in this capillary bed, we have the reversed order of uh, the transfer of gases. Uh, instead, now oxygen is leaving the capillary and going to the tissue cells of the body. Right? So these are the tissue cells of the body. Right? Of which there are roughly 30 trillion of. And at the same time, because these 30 trillion or so cells are using the oxygen in the process of cellular, re cellular respiration, they're also giving off the CO2. And so the CO2 is leaving these cells and entering into the capillary. And then at the under end of the capillary, we have venules draining this blood, which is now deoxygenated, but it's high in CO2. And these venules converge and converge and converge and converge and converge. And at a certain point, their diameters are sufficiently large enough to be considered to be veins. And the veins will converge and converge and converge and converge and converge and converge, and converge until they finally converge into the two largest veins in the body, which are your superior and inferior vena cava, which are going to take that deoxygenated high CO2 blood back to the right side of the heart. Right? And so thus concludes our systemic circuit. But again, internal respiration within this greater context is just located at the level of these capillaries feeding or distributing blood to these uh, tissue cells of the body where O2 is leaving the capillaries and going to the tissue cells and the CO2 being uh, produced by those tissue cells is leaving those cells and entering the blood in the capillary. Okay, so now let's go back to uh, ventilation and talk about ventilation a little bit more specifically. So as a big picture concept, which I have in the box, up above, uh, ventilation uh, results from air flowing due to pressure gradients, all right? And more specifically, you have those pressure gradients between the lungs and the atmosphere, because ultimately that's what we want to do, right? We want to move air from the atmosphere into the lungs, and then we want to move that air from the lungs back into the atmosphere. And that's all going to be... Uh, uh, um, based upon changes in pressures between the air in the lungs and the air in the atmosphere. But always, no matter what, what direction the air is moving in, air is going to flow from a high pressure to a low pressure. So let's talk about the three different pressures that are important for understanding pulmonary ventilation or just ventilation. First of all, we have atmospheric pressure. And this is the pressure exerted by the air surrounding the body. And then all the gas is dissolved within that air. Now, normal atmospheric pressure is described as being 760 millimeters mercury. And that's at sea level, which we are at about, all right? So it doesn't matter, you know, if our pressure that we're at in Buffalo, New York is a little bit uh, less than that, um, for the most part, as far as physiologists are concerned, it's fine just using 760 as an all-encompassing standard for um, the amount of pressure that our bodies are exposed to on our environment. Now, this is very hard um, to understand when you're first learning this, but the thing is, is 760 is kind of a big, cumbersome number to deal with. And really, when we're talking about pressures with respect to our uh, respiratory system, we only really care about the pressures relative to one another. So a lot of times what we do is we can just say that normal standard pressure can just be equal to zero, all right? And then we can compare other pressures, all right, in relation to that zero mark. So it's almost like we're taking 760 and we're saying that's our baseline, we're going to tear it, we're going to make it our new official baseline, and we're just going to call it zero just so we can compare other pressures um, that we may need to compare it to it um, in a more user-friendly way. 
So keep that in mind. That's why sometimes you'll see 760 millimeters mercury pressure or atmospheric pressure um, being uh, uh, abbreviated as zero millimeters mercury. So another important pressure we need to discuss is intrapulmonary pressure or intraalveolar pressure. Now, I wish we could refer to it as intraalveolar pressure because I think that term is more descriptive. It makes sense, right? If you call it intraalveolar pressure, well, it's the pressure inside the alveoli. However, um, from a clinical standpoint, unfortunately, the term intrapulmonary pressure is more common. So we want you to get used to using both. So first, learn the term intraalveolar pressure, and then just say like 20 times to yourself, recite it over and over and over again, that intraalveolar pressure is the same thing as intrapulmonary pressure, and then you'll get it. It's just the pressure inside of the alveoli. And then also we have intrapleural pressure. This is the pressure inside the pleural cavity. So this is the very, very, very thin space that's between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. If you recall, that space is actually filled with pleural fluid. All right? So a fluid itself can also exert a pressure. A pressure is not something that's just relegated to the realm of gases. All right? So again, when we're talking about the intrapleural pressure, we're just talking about the pressure within this very, very thin film-like space between the visceral and parietal pleura, which are filled or which is filled with um, uh, uh, pleural fluid. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the reason we have this intrapleural pressure, which by the way, as you can see right here, is always negative, uh, or I should say, I want to go back in my mind and think about the best way to, to say this so that it's the least confusing, which is always four millimeters mercury less than atmospheric pressure. So if we were to consider atmospheric pressure as being zero, as it's sometimes considered, just for the sake of ease, our intrapleural pressure would be negative four millimeters mercury, right? Because the intrapleural pressure is always going to be four millimeters mercury less than standard atmospheric pressure. But if we wanted to talk about standard atmospheric pressure in a real sense as to what its actual pressure is, which is 760 millimeters mercury, then technically speaking, our intrapleural pressure would be 756 millimeters mercury, right? Because that number, 756 millimeters mercury, is four millimeters mercury less than 760. Again, I think it's easier if you just tear the 760 millimeters mercury uh, atmospheric pressure, say now it's zero, and then it's easy to remember negative four, all right, is your intrapleural pressure, meaning that it's uh, four millimeters mercury less than your uh, uh, atmospheric pressure. Right. So it's very important that we always have this intra-atmospheric pressure, or rather, I'm sorry, intrapleural pressure uh, being minus four millimeters mercury compared to the atmospheric pressure because it creates kind of a partial vacuum or a suctioning effect so that that visceral pleura stays really tightly adhered to the parietal pleura. And when we inhale, as we'll talk about when we talk about the mechanics of ventilation coming up very soon, what happens is, is our whole rib cage expands and the diaphragm flattens, so the whole thoracic cavity expands, and that pulls on our parietal pleura. And because of this suctioning effect of this negative intrapleural pressure, in turn, the visceral pleura also are pulled, and that stretches out all the lungs, which creates a widening right, or an increasing of the volume of all of these millions and millions of alveoli, which then causes the pressure in those alveoli to drop partially. And that is the driving force that actually sucks in the air, right, that's from our atmosphere. And again, remember, ultimately, the driving force for this gas moving is going to be it moving from a high pressure to a low pressure. So if you suddenly decrease the pressure in the alveoli, so the pressure in the alveoli, the intrapulmonary pressure, is less than the atmosphere atmospheric pressure, the air from the atmosphere is going to rush through your bronchial tree and into the alveoli, right? And that's basically how we have inhalation. So atelectasis, which is the word that's described right here, is basically when you have a collapsed lung. So when you lose this negative four 
intrapleural pressure, then you don't have this suctioning effect anymore so that the uh, parietal pleura does not tug on the visceral pleura and we're not able to expand the lungs when we increase the volume of our thoracic cavity during inhalation. Right? And as a result, the lungs are going to effectively collapse. They're no longer going to be able to inflate. And that's what atelectasis is. It is a collapse of the lungs. Okay, so uh, let's talk about inspiration. I already went over some of it with you, but we'll just go through it a little bit more thoroughly and a little bit more slowly. So during inspiration or inhalation, the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles contract. So what happens when the diaphragm contracts is it actually flattens. So you can see the diaphragm right here in this diagram, right? I'm trying to drawing in the outlines of the diaphragm for you. So what's going to happen is, is the diaphragm is actually going to flatten when it contracts. And then your external intercostal muscles, which you can see drawn in here on this diagram, are going to pull the ribs up collectively like an awning. Right? And as a result, the entire rib cage and the sternum is going to elevate and widen both in the lateral and anterior posterior directions. The collective effects of both of these events, the external intercostal muscles and the diaphragm contracting, is that the entire thoracic cavity expands. All right? Now remember, I told you because of that negative intrapleural pressure creating this kind of suctioning effect between the visceral and parietal layers, when the whole rib cage expands, that tugs on the parietal pleura, and then in turn the parietal pleura tug on the visceral pleura, and then in turn the visceral pleura expand the whole lung tissue outwards so that all of those alveoli expand in their volume, right? So the total volume of the lung increases. Now, whenever you expand the volume of any type of chamber, like structure, its pressure is going to drop, right? And this is a basic uh, pressure and volume relationship described in the book as Boyle's Law. You don't have to get that technical about it, but basically Boyle's Law is pressure is proportional to one over volume, right? So if you increase your volume, right, then essentially what you're going to do is you are going to decrease your pressure. And that's exactly what happens. So now the pressure within the alveoli, their intraalveolar or intrapulmonary pressure drops. It becomes less than your atmospheric pressure. And you know, nature abhors a vacuum. Well, nature abhors a partial vacuum. Air from your atmospheric pressure or air from the atmosphere rather, right, which has a higher pressure is going to rush into the alveoli to ameliorate that difference. Okay, so during exercise, um, there are other muscles that can help expand the uh, thoracic cavity even more. For example, pectoralis minor muscles, sternocleidomastoid muscles. Um, it can help you out even more in that respect to be able to uh, take in even more air than that normal 500 milliliter uh, tidal volume, which we'll talk about later in our uh, last lecture on lung volumes. All right, so let's talk about the mechanics of expiration or exhalation, the act of breathing out. So basically with exhalation, the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles relax. And as a result, the entire thoracic cavity decreases in its volume. And so as a result, you see a contraction of the parietal pleura surrounding the lungs and in turn a contraction of the visceral pleura. And that basically causes the alveoli to be kind of squeezed or compacted, and that is the force necessary to drive the air out. Now, this is really uh, preconditioned on the natural elastic properties of the lung tissue itself. Remember when we talked about uh, the bronchial tree um, and the alveoli, there's lots of elastic fibers everywhere. So when you stretch out all those structures, they have a tendency to recoil back on themselves, especially the alveoli that is absolutely essential in ensuring that exhalation is able to occur. We're gonna talk about COPD later, and with one type of COPD called, and by the way, COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, 
meaning you have air obstruction, meaning that you have a hard time exhaling, uh, you lose the elastic fibers surrounding the alveoli, and so you're not able to effectively exhale as well as you should be. And as a result, air is blocked from leaving the lungs. That's what we refer to as obstruction. And it occurs over a long period of time, so we call it chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Again, that's just um, a heads up about what's to come later on. But anyways, so again, it's this natural elasticity, this natural recoil of the lung tissue itself that is the driving force that is actually getting the air out. So exhalation is actually a very passive process compared to inhalation. Inhalation involves the activity of the diaphragm and the external intercostals. Sometimes other muscles as well, like your sternocleidomastoid muscles or pectoralis minor muscles. Uh, but in contrast to that, exhalation is just a passive process. The muscles relax, and then just the muscle, or rather the lungs, just recoil back upon themselves. Now, during exercise, you can have the contraction of other muscles, like your internal intercostals, uh, also muscles of your abdominal uh, uh, cavity anterior wall, uh, like your oblique muscles, can help in the process of further expelling air out if needed, all right? So again, these aid in creating a greater force of exhalation. Okay, so uh, physical factors influencing pulmonary ventilation. Uh, airway resistance, which is created by friction in the respiratory passageways. Examples of why you might have uh, friction in the respiratory passageways, this can be from asthma, which is acute resistance. This comes from acute narrowing of the air passageways. Uh, asthma can be due to cold weather. It can be due to allergens. Um, you can have asthma status post uh, having a cold. Uh, there's a lot of different triggers for asthma, but it's acute resistance, meaning it happens over a short period of time and is usually uh, self-limited. Uh, chronic bronchitis is a form of COPD. Remember, I just talked about COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, I talked about specifically um, a type of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease known as um, emphysema. Well, another type of chronic ob obstructive pulmonary disease is chronic bronchitis. This is where over time, because of long-term exposure to some type of irritant like uh, cigarette smoke, you have chronic inflammation of your uh air passageways, especially bronchioles, which causes those bronchioles to narrow, all right? So you just get a lot of scar tissue, basically, over a long period of time. So in any effect, whether you have chronic bronchitis or asthma, if you have a narrowing of your air passageways, especially at the level of the bronchioles, uh, then you are going to have the resistance to air flowing through them. And as a result, uh, that is going to hinder your ability to uh, properly ventilate those alveoli. Another issue is um, alveolar surface tension. So remember, we talked about the type 2 cells or the type 2 pneumocytes or the type 2 um, alveolar cells. Those are those uh, roughly cuboidal cells intermixed between the squamous type 1 cells. These type 2 cells produce a detergent-like substance called surfactant, which decreases the surface tension of the water, which bathes those type 1 cells, those uh, squamous epithelial cells. It's that surface tension of that water that bathes those cells that tends to collapse the alveoli, which are extremely uh, fragile. And so what happens is, is because of this detergent, we decrease the surface tension of the water, bathing the squamous epithelial cells of the alveoli, and as a result, they're, they're able to maintain their shape. Um, Respiratory distress of the newborn is something you see in premature uh, um, uh, uh, children born before 25 weeks. Um, it's before that time period that uh, uh, the lungs actually have the ability to actually make their own surfactant. And, and so for uh, newborns born before this time, uh, they may actually have to be administered artificial surfactant, which didn't become available till, until I think like the end of 1989 or something. Um, and before that, um, that was a, a major, um, you know, uh, um, obstacle for the survival of, um, uh, of premature uh, children or babies born prematurely.
Okay, so another important factor in influencing uh, pulmonary ventilation is lung compliance. Lung compliance is basically um, the ease with which the lungs and the thoracic wall can expand during uh, breathing, and then also the, the ease to which it can recoil upon itself. So compliance is kind of a two-way street. It's the ability for the lungs to stretch out and for those alveoli to stretch out, but it also has to do with the ability of those alveoli to retract or recoil back upon themselves. Remember, we said that having those elastic fibers is absolutely essential for um, exhalation. If you don't have those fibers there, then the alveoli are not going to be able to passively expel that air and you're not going to be able to have an effective um, exhalation. So remember, I told you the other type of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is called emphysema. And you can see emphysema here in this lower panel, or I should say a, a diagram or cartoon of a, an emphysematous lung, more specifically alveoli in an emphysematous lung. In a normal lung, which is depicted up above with the, the, these nice, neat, continuous um, elastic fibers surrounding the alveoli, when we inhale, these elastic fibers are stretched out, and then when we exhale, they recoil back on themselves and act as the driving force of exhalation. However, if you have uh, someone with the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, best described as emphysema, they have long-term destruction of these uh, elastic cells, and that actually has to do with your um, dust cells, your alveolar macrophages, over time, they're trying to get rid of all of these irritants like cigarette smoke, soot, et cetera. And in the process of doing that, they actually auto-digest the lung. They auto-digest your own elastic fibers. Well, in this case, what happens is, is the alveoli have a fine time stretching out, but then they just can't uh, recoil back upon themselves and get uh, or produce a nice, efficient exhalation. All right? And that's where the obstruction in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease comes in. You have a fine time getting the air in, but the problem is getting it out. And so as a result, once the air comes in, some of it is obstructed from getting out. Okay, so again, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. We're going over this over and over and over again because clinically speaking, you're going to see a lot of patients with COPD. COPDers, a lot of times they come in for what are known as exacerbations which are usually triggered by you know, head colds or, or other types of infectious diseases. And that's enough to just kind of throw them off their axis and they come in and um, you know, oftentimes they have extended uh, periods of stay within the hospital. And so COPD, as we said before, usually comes in two basic flavors. You have chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Uh, chronic bronchitis is when you have a narrowing of the bronchioles over a long period of time. Emphysema, as we just said, is when you have a breakdown of the elastic fibers surrounding the alveoli. In either case, you have a fine time getting air in because those uh, muscles of respiration, your diaphragm and your external intercostals are working just fine. The problem is, is that this passive process of allowing the lungs to settle back into their normal uh position and expel that air out has been compromised. In chronic bronchitis, the airways are narrowed, so it's just harder to get that air out. And then in emphysema, the alveoli themselves just don't immediately settle back into their, their normal uh, shape and size. Instead, they don't have that same ability as a, a, a normal healthy lung would have to be able to recoil back upon themselves. Okay, so now what I want to do is just talk about this very, very important concept of a partial pressure of a gas. And so we're going to talk about Dalton's Law, but I don't want you to get too obsessed over the chemistry aspect of this. Dalton's Law is a very, very simple concept. Oftentimes in our environment, we're dealing with uh, uh, gases that are in the form of mixtures, or I guess a more elegant way to say it would be uh, when we're dealing with air, we're dealing with a mixture of gases. And if we're dealing with any other type of um, uh, gaseous interface, usually what we're dealing with is a gas which is composed of multiple different types of gas molecules. Well, theoretically, we can think about those different gas molecules or those different types of gas molecules with any type of gas like air as being their own separate entities. And while the overall gas, like for example, air will exert a certain pressure, like we said, atmospheric pressure is 760 uh, millimeters mercury, right? 
those individual air molecules like oxygen and nitrogen and argon or what have you um, are going to theoretically exert their own pressures and those pressures will be proportionate to the amount of that particular type of particle that's in the air. So for example, um, atmospheric air has about 20% oxygen in it, right? So we said that the total atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters mercury. Well, the partial pressure or the part of that pressure that's contributing or being contributed by the oxygen is going to be 20% of that 760 millimeters mercury because the air uh, contains 20% um, oxygen. Does that make sense to everybody where, where, where partial pressures are derived from? So that when you take all of those individual partial pressures in any type of gas and a mixture of gases and you add them all up, you will end up getting the total pressure for that mixture of gases. So for example, you know, air is mostly nitrogen, but there's also argon and, and CO2 and oxygen. If you add up all the partial pressures contributed by all those different component gases, which are proportional to the amount of any of those particular gases that are in the air, then you're going to get the total atmospheric pressure of the air, which is about 760 millimeters mercury. Okay. So we're going to talk a lot about partial pressures. And so this is where it gets a little bit confusing. And sometimes I go into depth into this. If you're dealing with a lecture situation, I probably kind of go off on a tangent. But the truth of the matter is, is that you don't have to know this as thoroughly as many texts actually present it. Um, and so I kind of am debating, even as I talk, you know, how far do I really want to go into this? Um, but I, I think we'll keep it as superficial as possible, just because you guys have a lot of territory to catch up with, and, and we've had a lot of setbacks before. I'd like to go in and, and talk more about this and, and bring in a, a bottle of Pepsi or whatever and talk about that and uh, and, and the chemistry of that, but I, I just, I feel that maybe you guys just don't want to go that far into it right now, especially everything that's going on. So let's just stick to this slide right here. And we'll keep it as simple as we possibly can. So as we said before, the partial pressure of any gas in a mixture of a gas is dependent on its concentration in that gas. So the more concentration of oxygen you have dissolved in any other type of gas, whether it is the gas in the alveolus or the gas in our atmosphere, the more oxygen you have, the greater the partial pressure of oxygen, right? In turn, the lower the concentration of oxygen in any gas, whether it is the gas in our alveoli or the gas in our atmosphere, um, the lower the amount of oxygen you have, the lower the partial pressure of that oxygen. And it really isn't any more complex or it need not be any more complex than that. All right, so enough about partial pressures. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is before we get into, let me just look ahead a little bit further. Yeah, I think now what we're going to do is we're going to go into internal and external respiration a little bit more thoroughly. And then we're going to talk about... Uh, the main buffer system of our blood, and then some other concepts related to that, and then talk about our uh, respiratory drive in our um, brain stem before finally going into pulmonary volume. So we still have quite a ways to go, and I'm curious to see also if the sound family worked for this particular lecture. So I think I'm going to leave it off right here, and then we'll get back to um, talking about external and internal respiration in a little bit more detail with our next physiology lecture. All right, hope the sound works. I'll see you guys soon.